The Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School convened a gathering in March 2017 titled Taking Our Meds Faithfully, Christian Engagements with Psychiatric Medication, supported by the McDonald Agape Foundation. We invite you to join us for some of these conversations. I'm Brent McCarty. I'm a doctoral candidate here at Duke Divinity School uh, working in theological bioethics. I work closely with the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative, and it's my great joy today to be joined by Dr. Jeffrey Bishop, who's the Tenant Chair in Healthcare Ethics at St. Louis University, where he directs the Albert Ganegi Healthcare Ethics um, Center. It's great to have you here, Jeff. Thank Thanks, you. Brent. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Um, so I'd love for you to just take a moment to give us a bit of an overview of your research and your interest, and, and then after that maybe describe how that intersects with questions around psychopharmacology. Okay. Well, I am a physician. I, was a, I trained as an internist um, um, in the early 90s um, and uh, completed a residency in internal medicine in 1996 and been on the faculty of several medical schools over the, uh, the next few years. While I was on the faculty at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, I also uh, began studying theology at the graduate level and then moved into a PhD program in, uh, in philosophy. Uh, and my interests have always been the social, moral, political, and philosophical foundations were the kinds of practices that emerge out of contem in, in contemporary medicine, specifically around the body and how medicine thinks about the body and how the body becomes a thing for medicine. Um, and then how the brain becomes a thing is, is also, uh, uh, and of course brains are things, you know, and, and bodies are things, um, but, the, but it takes a particular kind of twist uh, or turn in contemporary uh, medicine, uh, especially, well, beginning in the 19th century, but especially as we move into the 20th century with the way science begins to, medical science begins to explode in the 20th century, and we become more and more interested in the body as mere object. Uh, and then now, most recently, the brain as mere object as well. Um, so that's how my interests uh, emerged, and that's how I, I come to uh, think about questions related to psychopharmacology, which is why I guess I've been invited here. Great, so. great. Well, it's so good to have you here. So in your paper uh, for this conference, you talk some about the technological imaginary that's uh, developed. Um, I'd, I'd love for you to explain that concept a bit and also maybe to say some about how Christians may be kind of problematically taking up that imaginary also. Well, of course, I pick up uh, the idea of an imaginary from Charles Taylor, who's made it very popular. Of course, it predates Taylor by a little bit. And, um, and the idea is that certain, certain things become possible for a group of people who share a common time and a common set of assumptions about the nature of, well, many things, um, about the nature of the body or the nature of the brain. Um, and I think that there's a particular way in the last 20 to, well, maybe a little longer than that, 20 to 50 years where the technological uh, dimension of our lives has kind of captured our imagination as a culture in a way that that um, sort of overwhelms other ways of thinking about bodies and the way and brains and minds and so um, so I started thinking about the way that the technological imaginary drawings some 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 early or 1950s work of Martin Heidegger about the technological and framing and, and began to think about this more broadly about how not just the elite in a society come to think about the brain as a technology to be manipulated or a device to be manipulated, but the way our culture itself is beginning to buy into that and how, how that imaginary not only enables certain ways of thinking, right, but constricts our ways of thinking about the body, the brain, the mind. 
say a bit more about this concept of inframing. I'm particularly interested in um, your claim that we think of the brain as a device. So, so Heidegger had this sense that, or this insight, I think, that our, our ways of thinking enable us to take up certain things in the world, take up with certain things in the world, okay? Um, and so the best sort of example would be uh, if we thought of technology not as the tools or the toys that we have, uh, iPhones, computers, uh, drones, you know, those are, the, those are the products of technology. And technology itself is more of a way of thinking, right? Or a way of seeing and knowing the world. And so technology is, and this is a simple, simplistic way of putting it, but technology is like the lenses that we, you know, certain things don't come into relief for me because I'm partially blind, right? So they don't come into relief for me until I put a certain technology, right, on, and now they come into relief. So technology permits certain objects to come into relief so that I can see them and know them and understand them in a certain kind of way. So that's what he means by, I think, by the inframing, but it, it's much deeper than that. So what he, what he wants to say is that the actual things in the world themselves only appear in, to us insofar as they are mediated by this te technological mindset or this technological framing, in, technological inframing, right? Um, and so if they only come into relief for us as those kind of objects when we're putting on a certain way of thinking about them, right, what are they in themselves? How might they appear if we have different ways of taking up with them, right? And, that, and I think that's, 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 that's what he means by inframing. And he wants to permit, you know, there's a, there are moments, I mean, Heidegger is a very complicated figure in history, and there are many things we need to reject about Heidegger. Um, but there's, there's this, there are these moments in Heidegger where he becomes almost mystical in the sense that he says, look, if, if, we, if we could just set aside these modes of inframing, not set them aside, but pay close attention to them, then reality might be speaking to us in a different way. What's real might be speaking to us in a different way, and we might find new ways of taking up with it, right? And so that's what he means by inframing, and that's what I'm trying to get us to begin to think about, you know. If we think of the brain as just a device, right, and the pill as another device, um, we forget that standing behind all devices are all kinds of steps, all kinds of processes going on, all kinds of powers behind those devices. But the device itself gives us the illusion that there's not much depth to it, right? That there's not anything else going on behind it. So, so I want to think about how this technological imaginary and the kind of inframing uh, ways of seeing the world and imagining the brain as a device, how have Christians maybe problematically taken up that imagination? Well, specifically Christians, I mean, there's a way in which when someone is suffering and you've got a tool that looks like it's just a tool, right? We, we tend to want to deploy it because we, we think it can't hurt. It seems, to, it seems like it might help. And, and so, and, and we're, we're here to help one another, right? Um, and that, that gets couched in a number of ways. Sometimes, uh, especially when you're being an apologist for technology, we talk about, uh, Christians sometimes talk about becoming co-creators with God, where we take the failures and frailties of creation and we say, let's intervene. Let's do something with this in order to make it better. Um, of course, as Christians, we're called to help. We're called to be there for one another. Uh, and sometimes that will mean intervening with medication. I've intervened with medication and surgeries and all kinds of things on patients for years and years when I was practicing medicine. Um, and those things are thought to be good. Um, and the... Um, so the, 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 the problematic ways of taking up with it is because we want to help, and sometimes you feel helpless, and when you feel helpless and you've got something that you think of as merely a tool, and you want to deploy that tool, it leads to that 
thinning out of, of what's really going on in a person's life, right? Um, and so what, what, is, what is lost um, when we deploy the tools gets covered over in a sort of utilitarian calculus where well, we're going to do good or we're hoping that something good comes out of this, right? And in deploying that tool, we're thinking only about the good and the losses that are there get minimized, right, in the, in the utilitarian calculus, right? You do the sum, and at the, at the end of the equation, everything is positive in the utilitarian calculus, right? Then you just continue to do it. The problem is, is that thins out the complexity of people's lives, their lived experiences. Um, and it, 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 it might even, in some instances, crowd out the possibility for God to act, right, in the midst of someone's suffering and someone's pain. Now, that said, we also believe God acts in the midst of intervening, okay? So I'm no, I don't want to minimize that at all. But I do want us to be thoughtful, reflective, prayerful about the way we think about those tools because they do thin things out. An, an example might be, I'll start with what I would think is somewhat of an easier example, like attention deficit, right, and the use of Ritalin or other stimulants to try to bring that under control. First, you know, there's a lot of question about whether attention deficit is a thing or if it is merely a concept that emerges in the late modern industrial West, right? Um, but, but let's assume it's some sort of, some sort of disorder. And we have a pill for it, then we give the pill, and the person is more focused. We get to the end, uh, we get to the, 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 uh, the utilitarian end of it, the being more effective as a member of society end of taking the pill. But what is lost are all of the practices that one has to participate in as one begins to learn how to control one's own attention, right? So so that, that if we don't have the pill, then society might have different educational programs. I mean, one of the things about attention deficit is the kids are all over the place. Well, that's because kids aren't necessarily designed to sit in a classroom and to just consume information. They're sort of designed or created to pick up and engage with the world and not sit still in a classroom, right? So rather than creating educational programs and societal structures that that take up what those kids are actually created to do and to be in the world, right? Rather than, and then teaching them how to gain control over that wild-eyed, you know, explore the whole world, right? Rather than creating practices that kind of help them to funnel and focus their attention, right? We get a pill, which then just allows them to become good consumers of information. Now, that's not to say that that isn't a good thing, right? But it, what it does is it allows the technological imaginary to, to dovetail very easily with a social imaginary that thinks of knowledge as nothing more than information to be used to make you a more productive member of, a, of the machine of society, right? So in doing that, we, we kind of become numb to the idea that we might actually be able to create richer societies, meaning more culturally, mentally, spiritually richer societies, if we had to engage in practices that, uh, and create structures that enabled those practices so that people could actually flourish, maybe in a way that's more in accord with creation. What I really appreciate is the, uh, the political nature of the technological imaginary that you're drawing out, the ways in which our decisions around um, psychiatric medication are part of a larger, much larger constellation of issues. Um, and so I'm wondering what that might mean for, for churches, for Christian communities that want to maybe um, model another way to be in this world. The technological imaginary is kind of the epistemological way of thinking about the world. And what it sees is a, the things in the world is nothing more than power relations. And what it does is say, we just got to maximize power or maximize, or maximize utility, right? So, so it deploys a whole way of thinking about the world. 
And I actually think that for Christians, that the world is not a power ontology. There's some other ontology at work when we look at the world through the lens of the cross, right? As opposed to the technological imaginary. So what I would say is that, you know, we have to return to our practices, our ways of taking up with the world that are liturgical, that require us to kind of haltingly take up with nature, accept it as, or rather creation as opposed to nature, to take up with creation haltingly in a kind of respectful stance, right? Well, that means that, that we're going to have to think about the ways we think about science, right? Or technology, or the, the way we take up with anything in the world, right? Um, and I think that means that out of that, we, ha we have to create institutions within the Christian community that permit us to see people not as someone who's failing to pick up and take up with the world and become productive in the you know, in the, in, the, in the work ethic that is, that is deployed in our contemporary society, right? But as someone who's, I mean, think about a child who maybe has attention deficit disorder. I mean, think of the, I mean, what is going on there? They're taking up with the world in wonderment, right? They're trying to explore it and understand it and, and take up with it in, a, in all kinds of different ways. That's a beautiful thing, right? But because of the way we do our education, we kind of put blinkers on that. We kind of stop it, right? Um, and so the, the question is, okay, well, if that's a beautiful way of taking up with the world, then what do we need to do to maybe enable some of that so that may, we might see the world differently than the way that we've been taught to see it through the technological imaginary? Um, and the same, and the same, the same thing when it comes to people who who do suffer in the midst of whatever the whether it's the technological imaginary or even the cruciform imaginary, right? Um, if, you're, if, you're, if they are suffering under that, maybe there are other ways that we take up with them, right? Forming a community around somebody who has depression, let's say, uh, that, you know, it's, people are constantly checking on them, constantly engaging them, constantly being, uh, uh, taking up with them in a different way than just saying, oh my goodness, they can't get back to work. So let's say you're, you're talking with that person who has experienced deep sadness, loss of energy, and thoughts of suicide for like the last 30 years. Um, what are some of the practices you'd recommend to, to him or her to resist the technological imaginary that you've so helpfully described? You know, um, I think the church has always had spiritual directors, communities of people that surround people who are suffering. And, you know, I, I I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't actually come up with a therapeutic model or, or what kinds of things are necessary. Um, but, I, but I do think that, that um, we have traditions, um, and, and unfortunately it, it, the traditions of spiritual direction got tied up mostly with the idea of confession, where it was simply, I've got to confess my sins, then I've got to get forgiven, and then all is well. In reality, that's kind of the manualist tradition of confession that comes about in the late, later medieval period. Prior to that, it wasn't quite like that. I think there was more, your spiritual director was your guide, right? The, the person that helps you to see yourself in ways you can't see yourself and imagine yourself in ways that you can't imagine yourself. Um, um, I think of it as, you know, in a way, my wife is my guide in marriage, right? She's the one who shows me all of my faults and all of the, 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 the dark, ugly things that I might say or do when I'm stressed. But by showing me those things, she, she gives me a chance to do some work on myself, right? And I think we have those traditions in, in spiritual direction and in confession. Now, of course, in confession, it makes it sound like somebody did something wrong. And, and I think the tr tradition has for a long time believed that you know, I think even Thomas Aquinas talks about melancholia as possibly something wrong with the, with the matter, what he means by that, we would say, with the biology, right? But he still sees it as an important aspect of, of finding a way to be faithful in the midst of the fact that I have failing biology. We all have failing biology. Um, and so, so maybe it is a problem with the material, but there are ways in spiritual things, prayer, uh, fasting, other things that we might be able to do, right, that will help to shape that biology itself. And, and, and so I think there probably are ways in which the this, this spiritual dimension 
even if we don't think of confession as I've got to tell you all the wrong things I've done, right? If we think of it as someone who is literally telling their story, right, to a guide, right, and that guide is reflecting back that story and gives them a chance to see who they are or who they've become or who they, what they look like from the, another set of eyes, right? Uh, that gives them a chance to, to change themselves, to begin to engage in those practices of self-reflection or practices of prayer that might actually also help with the melancholia or the depression. Great. You, you mentioned um, <clears throat> other ways of taking up with the world, and I'm wondering if your description of spiritual direction could be paired with uh, an alternate understanding and way of taking up with psychiatric medication. With the rise of modern natural science, we began to think of everything as a scientific, biological question according to the precepts of naturalism. Okay? In other words, we're just a kind of natural thing that, that is all from the ground up, from genes to brains to behaviors, right? That's sort of the way people think about it. And there's no sense that there's a way to have a top-down, you know, where some, some, something, some thought, some thinking, some mode of consciousness might feed back downward and begin to shape it the other direction, right? We've lost that as a way of thinking. What I think that means is that we have to think of medicine and psychiatry as fundamentally a spiritual, moral endeavor, and that the information we gain from the natural sciences has to be in service of that, of that spiritual, moral dimension, as opposed to the other way around, where we think, oh, the biology is what enables the spiritual, right? Because it's all ground up, and finally we get consciousness. No. Consciousness can feed back downward, right? And the, and the consciousness, the awareness, right, which is not just an awareness of myself, but aware, an awareness of the world, awareness of my relations to other people, and an awareness to my relation to the whole, which might be my awareness of my relation to God, right, can feed back downward to shape the kinds of beings that we are, materially speaking. And how might that look constructively for psychiatric medication? <laughs> right now, it's, it's a difficult thing because modern psychiatry exists within the technological imaginary, which has the political dimension of our social imaginary, right? So right now, it all takes place outside of that. It's almost as if our spirituality is, is a, little, uh, a little salt and pepper added onto the top of the biological meat of, of, of my brain, right? That, 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 that the spiritual is just a little decoration, a, a style. Um, and that's the way modern psychiatry, I fear, is, is thought. And I think for Christians, we have to reclaim that actually psychiatry is a tool aimed at other kinds of ends, other kinds of purposes that are articulated from the spiritual moral dimension of Christianity, or even possibly Islam or Judaism, right? So spiritual directors who can prescribe uh, psychiatric medication? I, I think not, you don't have to be a spiritual director. Yeah. Uh, let's put it this way. I think spiritual directors might need to be directing whether someone needs medication at times. And that sounds so fundamentally foreign to the way the entire political power of psychiatry is currently deployed that people are going to write me off as a quack if I say something like that. But I wonder if that's not the case. You know, a spiritual director might, who, who is sophisticated enough to know when it's, a pri when it, when it's, it's so risky uh, uh, that, that they might need medication to kind of attenuate that risk so that the spiritual work can be done. But I think it has to be under the, yeah, it has to be under the roof of the church, right, in order for that, for it to really, to avoid taking it up as the technological imaginary that modern psychiatry is. Jeff, it's always a joy to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brett. For further interviews and other resources on Christian engagements with psychiatric medications, please visit our website, tmc.divinity.duke.edu.